A reading from the Gospel of John. Now in Jerusalem, by the Sheep Gate, there is a pool, called in Hebrew Beth Zapha, which has five porticos. In these lay many ill, blind, lame, and paralyzed people. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? The ill man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am making my way, someone else steps down ahead of me. And Jesus said to him, Stand up. Take your mat and walk. At once the man was made well, and he took up his mat and began to walk. For the word of God in Scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. Do you remember the miracle that led you to this place? Maybe this place is Broadway United Methodist Church, but I mean bigger than that. The miracle that led you to this place, the place that you are in your life that that, uh, makes you get up early on a Sunday morning... And come here, whether it was here or, you know, I I imagine most of you, if you uh, were to move to some other town, uh, uh, one of the first things you would do is you'd find the place that you would be on a Sunday morning. Do you remember the miracle that brought you to that place? We all have a miracle, well, maybe not a, we all have a miracle or miracles that have led us to this space. We may not remember, we may not even think of them as miracles. The truth is, we often talk about miracles like they are all uh, Saul to Paul miracles, right? A moment in time where we were these awful people, and all of a sudden, bam, God knocks us off our horses, And we are blind until we finally are able to open our eyes and see. And now we are on the right path and we become on fire for God. That's the kind of miracles that we're often told or taught about. or, Or the kind of miracles that involve burning bushes and voices from on high. Those are the miracles that we're often told about. But the truth is, one of my other favorite kinds of, of, of uh, 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 transformation miracles in Scripture, they're not all Saul to Paul. Many of them, my story, is mostly a uh, Simon to Peter miracle, series of miracles. Simon, who was always a Jew, was always a, fo- a follower of God, and often was the first one to step up and say, pick me, pick me, Jesus. And Jesus was often held up by Jesus to say, hey, you're the first one. You did it. You, this was awesome. And then immediately after, get behind me, Satan. Oh, you have little faith. Oh, you know, can you imagine? That's me. But that doesn't mean for all of my mistakes and for all of the fact that it was like subtle two steps forward and one step back in my life. It doesn't mean those were any less miracles. I have some moments that I could tell you about, but the truth is, most of my miracles have names. Rita Ravy, my grandmother who was raised in the Church of the Nazarene, but never really fit with her because uh, it just never felt, the church just never felt so big enough for the grace that she understood from God in the scriptures that she read. And so when she first encountered a United Methodist church, really when she first encountered the United Methodist women and the justice work that they were committed to, she, she knew these were my people. And she's the one that said to my mom when I was just a, a, a little kid, are you going to raise him in the church? My mom who hadn't gone to church uh, because my dad didn't go to church. They didn't go to church until I was born, and, my, and Rita Raby said to my mom, you going to raise him in the church? My mom said, yes. And my grandma said, when? 
And the very next Sunday, I was at First United Methodist Church in Tempe, where I went all the way up until the time I started the ordination process and began working at different churches. Pat Wilson, one of my miracles, Pat Wilson, the, my mom who wasn't always the one to teach me about scripture, but was absolutely the one to teach me of what grace looked like with its work clothes on. I was not an easy kid. My dad was the one who reminded me all the time. He and I fought back and forth all the time. And, and as I look back now as a parent, I recognize he had every right Every right to be frustrated. My mom was, who, was the one who taught me what grace looked like in practical circumstances. Delin Selleck, some random woman who happened to be playing at the church that I went to when I was 20 and knew that I needed to go back to church and didn't know what to look for, and I just randomly walked into a church, and she randomly happened to be playing at one because she was trying to get out of a bad marriage, and all she knew to do was how to play music at a church, and so that's where she went when she needed some income, some independent income. She didn't want anything to do with faith, and I didn't know what kind of faith I was looking for, and we met each other, and we had some messy conversations over the next couple of years, and now she is one of my best friends, and she's a minister in, uh, uh, in Virginia. My miracles mostly have names. Do you remember the miracle that brought you here? By the time we get here, we often forget that it was miraculous, that it opened our eyes to new ways of thinking and new ways of seeing. We so quickly fall back into patterns and assume that if it's not that same thing, that it may not be a miracle anymore. Or if we are living into the place that the miracle brought us, that that's good enough. Instead of continuing to look for where the miracle is happening next or how we are living into the miracle so that others might see it. This story, I love this story. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Have I, did, I tell, did I warn you? You're going to hear that a lot over the next couple of years. This is one of my favorite scriptures from the Gospels. You need a little background story. So this, this pool in Beth Zatha, this pool, at one point, an angel had come down and stirred the waters with its finger. And anybody who got into the water while it was still moving was instantly healed. Which meant that after that happened, now the story never tells us whether that happened multiple times or if it just happened once. We don't know. Maybe it just happened once and everybody had gathered around that place waiting to see if it would happen again. Maybe it happened weekly. We don't know. But this place had five porticos, five uh, you know, arches, archways, doorway, sort of large doorways where people would gather and they would set up their spots and they would wait for the water to be stirred. But this man, this man had been waiting for 38 years and the problem is he couldn't walk for whatever reason. We don't know why. He couldn't walk and so while the water was stirred, if it was ever stirred again, let's assume that it was. Every time the water was stirred, he couldn't get down there in time. You can imagine the throngs of people trying to get down to the edge of the water in time. He couldn't get down there in time without help. Jesus sees him. And we know, this story doesn't say this, but we know, we often hear, Jesus moved by compassion, right? Jesus sees him, knows that this man has been waiting for a long time. Jesus asks him what? Why aren't you, why don't you get to the pool? No. Jesus asks him, what, do you want help down to the pool? No. What does Jesus ask him? What is it? Do you want to be well? Do you want to be made well? Now, to somebody who's been waiting for 38 years to get into that water, who's probably been elbowed out of the way by people who have waited a lot less time, you might be a little bitter about that question, right? You might get a little defensive. I might get a little defensive. Hey, buddy, you might think I'm sitting back here because I'm lazy. Is that what you're asking? You're saying, do I want to be, are you questioning how much I want this? 
Because I've been waiting for 38 years. But I got no help. There is nobody helping me get there. So don't come asking me if I want this bad enough. I'm probably going to die here waiting to get to that water. But I want it bad enough that I have not moved on. I have not given up. I still believe God is going to send a messenger down here, create a miracle, and maybe someday I will get a taste of it. But Jesus wasn't questioning whether or not he wanted it. Jesus was offering him something new. The man couldn't hear it because he was stuck in a paradigm that said healing, being made well, happens one way over there, the way it happened before, right? He was so stuck on that way, he couldn't see the miracle that had come to him. He was no longer seeing in terms of miracles, he was seeing in terms of an institution that had been built up around a miracle, right? This is the way the miracle happens, and so what do we do? We set up a system in which people set up, I mean, I, I bet there was a whole industry around there. I bet if you wanted to give to the poor, you knew where to find them, right? One of the places you find them, you go down to the, the pool of Bethzatha, you give out some alms there, right? There are probably people who, were, who would go down there and beg. Maybe that was one of the questions. Maybe that was part of the question. Do you want to make, be made well? Maybe part of the question from somebody who wasn't Jesus, somebody who didn't know, who didn't know about this man's history here, maybe part of the question was, do you want to be made well, or is this how you make your living, right? We ask that all the time. You see somebody on the streets asking for some money, and you ask, what, do they really need money, or is this how they make their living, Right? But Jesus doesn't ask those questions. That's our jadedness getting in. Jesus says, if you're in need, I am moved by compassion. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And even though the man never answers the question, Jesus already knows the answer. And he knows that the man's faith, even though the man can't see through the paradigm that he's stuck in, he knows that it is faith that has caused the man to stay for 38 years, even though the system that has been put in place doesn't work for him. It doesn't work for him. After 38 years, folks, that system doesn't work for him. But he is not giving up hope. And so Jesus says, let's stop waiting. Let's just make it happen. Let's just do it. Right? You think there were other people standing around waiting? You think in that pool around that miracle there were other people waiting? What about them? Did Jesus heal them? I don't know. Maybe if you told me Jesus went around and healed every single person at that pool, and this is just the story we get because it's uh, indicative of the thing that was happening, I would believe you. If you told me there was something special about this man that Jesus was showing us, I would believe you. But the point is, Jesus saw that this man believed in miracles even if he had forgotten that the miracle, the whole point of the miracle is it isn't bound by the systems and structures of the world as we understand it. So do you remember the miracle that brought you to this place? That caused us to build up the systems and structures that we now worship and celebrate in? We come every Sunday to remember that the world is bigger than any system we put in place. We have a beautiful, beautiful monument to a reminder that God is bigger than anything we can build with our hands. And that's okay. Jesus doesn't dismantle the pool of Bethzatha, but he reminds us that we don't need to wait for the miracle, that we need to make sure that we are offering the miracle to those for whom the structure doesn't work. We need to go find them. And by doing that, 
we remind ourselves of how big God's miracles truly are. Amen? Amen.